Praise God, hallelujah. Praise God, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. I want to um, just say two things uh, before we start the service today. I want to I want to pray for the hurricane relief. Um, I misjudged that, and uh, we didn't say anything about it on Friday, but I've been seeing a lot of posts coming up from um, from people in that region, and it's pretty bad. It's um, it's as bad as, uh, or worse than Katrina, they're saying. And um, it's important for us to get into a moment where we can just have a moment of silence and just pray, uh, each of us, and I'll, I'll make a corporate prayer. Uh, people are really struggling back there. It's pretty bad to see a city in the United States of America deal with those types of things. In the Northeast, we're a little spoiled because like we don't really see the um, black and white um, uh, like cops killing um, black people. We don't really see that around here, but it's in other parts of the country. We don't see a lot of natural disasters. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray for it because our brothers and sisters are in that region. So let's just take a moment of silence and then I'll do a corporate prayer. I guess they found a bunch of people trapped in a church for six days and um, I don't know, you kind of get caught up in the things that are happening in your own life and you don't realize that somebody else's life is, is difficult. Um, it's just the weight of the world. So Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith. And, and the ones that are not in the faith down in uh, the Bible Belt of the United States of America, Lord, for the people of North Carolina. Uh, Lord, you're, it's, it's, it's destroyed. The land is destroyed. Uh, they may not be able to find people they're saying for weeks, uh, but you know all things, Jesus. So we just pray for your provisional hand to be upon that region, Lord. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So we know that you're going to do something great. Let testimonies come out of that, Lord. The Bible says that those who love God, uh, that God turns all things for good for those who love him, Lord. We just ask for mercy. Lord, we understand that you are the owner of the wind and the waves. And what caused that was the wind and the waves. So you have a remedy and we trust in you, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I also want to um, just acknowledge two of our of our uh, brothers that are in the church had surgery, Brother Michael Clark and Brother Juan Munoz. Uh, they are in recovery right now, so we just pray for a speedy recovery for them. Uh, Brother Mike is watching at home. Brother Mike, I just want to tell you that um, the kids are running around eating crackers and it's all over the floor. <laughs> And if you should see, look, there's one running right now with the donut. They're wiping their hands on the seat. So uh, when you get back, you'll be able to see all of that. We love you guys. Uh, Brother Juan, thank you for uh, pouring into the youth. And I just pray that you guys have a speedy recovery. Today, uh, we pray that in the name of Jesus. Today, we are going to speak about Jesus and the false teachers. I didn't know why the Lord um, impressed it on my heart to to preach this, this message in the beginning of the week, I, you know, I kind of said, Lord, like, man, John 10. And um, I ended up going to a meeting uh, Tuesday and a leadership meeting at another church and the pastor wrote John 10 on the board. And I was like, all right, <laughs> it looks like Jesus had his way. So we're going to um, teach on John 10 today. It's about hearing the voice of God. Amen. If you want to know how to hear the voice of God, somebody say Amen. Right here. Praise God. There is only one voice of God. Are we, can we agree that there's only one voice of God? 
There's only one voice of God. And that's such a simple statement, but it causes so much confusion if you don't know the voice of God. The way that to know the voice of God is to know the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, the way that God wrote the Bible, not the way that you were taught how to hear God, the way that God wrote the Bible, you'll never be, you'll hear something, but it won't be the voice of God. Amen. I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to um, reveal the, the point of my message here. And I believe that the Lord has instructed me to do this so you can see where we're going to go uh, versus just bringing it up at the appropriate time. Elias, can you please put up on the board John 10.10? 10. Everybody's heard the saying before, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? Yes. Amen. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You hear it all the time. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Hey, you got to watch out for that pesky little Satan. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is nowhere to be found in Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's read this together. One, two, three. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So who is it that comes to steal, kill, and destroy? Is it the devil or is it the thief? The thief. That matters. Any subtle changes in scripture is demonic. You must train your brain to be that precise with the word of God. I want God to be precise with me. When God tells me that he's going to bless me in a certain way, I don't want it to be a different way by the time the blessing comes because then it doesn't bring me any benefit. Amen. What we are doing in this church is we are raising the bar of excellence toward the word of God. We want to raise the bar so that Christ and his excellence is exalted. So that the excellence that you require, that's required of you at your job, so you can get a promotion, it's, the, it's like that in the kingdom as well. We cannot be sloppy in the presence of God. God is not okay with the misuse and the twisting of the scriptures. That is so subtle. I, I used to be one of them one day, and I said, oh, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And somebody said to me, where is that in scripture? And I was like... And it's not there. If it's not there, it's not from God. It's not from God. Amen? All right. We're going to talk about Jesus and the false teachers. We're going to be in John 10. The way to best understand John 10 is to read John 7, John 8, and John 9. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, just a couple of verses out of each one. Remember that the Bible, when the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, he didn't tell the apostles chapter 10, verse 7. They wrote scripture in scrolls it's it's all one continuous narrative does that make sense we broke it up and god allowed us to break it up so our puny little brains our fleshly brains could could digest it because it's so dynamic the word of god is dynamic this is a scientific document because the kingdom is a science the kingdom of heaven is a science. It is complex. It's the most complex a system ever created. But through the spirit, we get intelligence. Amen? I want to tell you that it doesn't matter if somebody has a PhD. Don't listen to somebody based on position. Don't listen to somebody based on stature or accomplishment. Don't listen to somebody because they're a president of a, of a college. I know multiple people with PhDs that are in error in reading the word of God. This is only by the spirit. This is not by any, any, if when Mike was here, he used to do that before I used to. <laughs> Thank you for serving. It doesn't matter who says what the Bible says. God explains it clearly so that we can understand. So in order to understand John 10, you have to read a little bit so you can understand the context. So we're going to start in John 7, 14. And I'm just going to show you that in John 7, John 8, John 9, and John 10, Jesus is battling the religious folk. Jesus is battling the teachers. Jesus is battling the Pharisees. 
the Sadducees who came to twist the word of God. And Jesus says, I read this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how does this man know letters, meaning the Holy Scriptures, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Immediately we see that Jesus and the Father have the same voice. Does that make sense? Jesus and the Father have the same voice. Let me repeat that again. Jesus answered and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no one unrighteous and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? See, they couldn't even understand what Jesus was saying. So they immediately attack his character. Right? You got to understand the spiritual realm. Nobody can make the word of God. Nobody can change the word of God. What they can do is they can attack you but they can never attack the truth that's coming out of you because truth doesn't change, right? If something happened, what, what happens in a court system? That there's, somebody says their story and somebody says their story and the role of the judge is to discern what is true. Now we go into John, so we see Jesus battling with the religious folk in seven. We go into John 8, verse 23. And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? And he said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them from the Father. You see, there's moments when Jesus is speaking and people don't understand. It's in Scripture, so it's still happening today. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. They don't understand because he's not speaking their false doctrine. Again in John 8, verse 31 through 47. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now at the time when that, that's a very popular saying, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall, set you, shall make you free. Jesus is speaking about the Torah and the prophets, because there's no other truth at this time, right? Yeah. Amen. I got, I got one in agreement. That's all I need is one. Verse 33, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants. See, that's what the religious folk always thought that was their blessing. They thought because we're the descendants of Abraham, we can do what we want. They thought because we're the descendants of Abraham, we're preferred by God. Then they answered him, and we are descendants, Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do not have uh, excuse me, and you do not, excuse me, and you do what you have seen with your father, two groups. And then he answered and said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but you seek to kill me. A man, capital M, showing divinity, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? 
because you're not able to listen to my word. Certain, there's certain words from God that if you don't listen to God through the spirit, you're not going to even understand that it's God speaking. Jesus is telling them, you're saying that you know God and God is standing right in front of you speaking to you and you don't even know what I'm saying. This is still happening today in the church. I, my heart breaks. My heart breaks for the body of Christ. I can only imagine the heart of the Father. My heart, Brian Mojica's heart, it breaks at the confusion of my brothers and sisters. It breaks my heart that we're so confused. I was confused until right before we opened this church. Most people do not even know how to read the word of God, let alone what it says. And God wants to do something about that because he knows that this is a continual problem. So Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and come from God. Nor have I come to myself, but he who sent me. Uh, verse 43, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and desires of your fa and the desires of your father you want to do. This is Jesus unloading on the false teachers. Jesus just completely unpacks the kingdom of God, and he tells them, you're not, you're not with me. You're not with me. Making a distinction that there's two voices. Jesus says, your voice doesn't sound like my father's voice, so your voice sounds like the other father's voice, lowercase f, little homie. So he says to him, he says to him, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of, the, of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. There's other versions that say that the devil speaks his lies, and it's his native language. Anytime a lie is spoken, whether from my mouth or anybody else's, Satan is there especially with the twisting of scripture. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, so we've seen in seven, Jesus attacking the religious folk. We see in eight, Jesus calling out the false teachers. Jesus went after the religious folk and the false teachers way more than he ever did with the devil. Yes. Jesus was after the false teachers more than ever. Yes. That is significant because we make it seem like Jesus and the devil is what the Bible is all about. No. Here's the order of your battle. Your flesh is your biggest enemy. Your flesh, that's why when something happens in your life and you're like, oh, the devil's trying to get me today. The devil's like, I ain't even in that. That wasn't even me. That's your bitterness. That's the anger in your heart, your lack of ability of loving your brother. So what happens is when the flesh gets activated, because we're not naive to the wiles of the devil, we cover him in the blood of Jesus. We, 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 what we do is when the flesh is activated, then we come in partnership with the father of all deception. Now the devil works in partnership with our flesh. Because that's when the Bible says don't give the devil a foothold, that's the foothold. Yes, the foothold is when you break the commandments. The foothold is when you allow your flesh to be activated. So that's why Jesus is coming. So anyway, so the, your, your number one enemy is your flesh. Your second greatest enemy is a false teacher. That's who Jesus went after. The devil is an afterthought. John 9, Jesus heals a blind man. And they have an issue that he heals a blind man. So Jesus starts unpacking and just completely embarrassing these false teachers that are twisting the word of God. They brought him who formerly was blind. Excuse me. They brought him, verse 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 13 through 9. Jesus heals a blind man. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. They were such in such disbelief that Jesus was performing these miracles that they kept saying, you were blind, 
Wasn't he blind? Jesse, you remember that that guy was blind, right? Go get him. Bring him over here. The blind guy that he's always been blind. The guy that was always crippled. The guy that we, we just walked right past. Bring him over here. He was the one that was blind. Verse 16, therefore the Pharisee said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath and they're saying that he's sinning because he did something good for somebody on the Sabbath. Another said, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? Even in, their, even in their false teachings, they're confused. And there was a division among them. Verse 17, and then they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He responded, he said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he now see? Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We ask that you open the minds of your people. Lord, I'm speaking to your sheep. These are your sheep. They belong to you, every single one. Lord, help me to lead them into your presence. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So now we get into chapter 10, and we're going to just go through the first 30 verses. Jesus says, most assuredly, anytime Jesus says, most assuredly, it's like Spanish folk when they're like, yo, what did you say? It's like something about to pop off. Amen. So Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. You see, there's a way, there's a way that Jesus speaks. There's a way that Jesus interacts with us. There's a way where you can know the voice of God. When Jesus says, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Jesus is using an illustration to talk to you about a false teacher. You see, the Lord is a gentleman. He does not force himself on you. He does not try to confuse you. The Bible says he, that, that when he comes into your presence, he comes in through the normal method. But a thief and a robber, they jump the wall. Okay? This is the illustration from Jesus. But he who enters the door, the sheep, uh, excuse me, but he who enters the door is the sheep of the shepherd. That is significant to understand. Give me one second. Somebody praise God, please. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We praise the name of Jesus. We praise the name of Jesus. All right. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep, making a difference in behavior. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Now we see Jesus calling his sheep. We see Jesus calling and leading. Jesus is calling his sheep, and he's giving them direction. But the sheep only respond to the voice of the shepherd. There are countless videos on YouTube where they've dressed up a shepherd in different clothes. But the shepherd makes a sound that the sheep... Even though he's dressed in different clothes, that the sheep respond to the shepherd. I found out through research in, for this, this assignment that the Lord has me on today. That sheep, the ears of the sheep, when they hear the voice of their shepherd, the ears turn of the sheep. You hear it all the time in the Bible, the sheep, the sheep. It's a reference to an animal, not an animal that is dumb, an animal who is vulnerable but obedient. Okay? The relationship, David is, is constantly speaking about um, being a sheep, being a shepherd. So now we see that Jesus says to him, the doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Jesus calls us by name. Anybody that has a pet knows what that's like. Okay, so it's not like this is hard to see. You can see it in the world. 
So he calls them by name and he leads them out. He doesn't push them out. The Bible says he leads them out. He doesn't drive you to do anything. He doesn't force his way upon you. When the doorkeeper opens the door, the sheep hear his voice. The sheep hear his, they hear their name, he leads them out. Verse 4, when he brings out his sheep, he goes before them. You see, when a shepherd that cares about you does not want you to walk by yourself, that's why David said, although I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, You're with me. Not only are you with me, but your rod and your staff comfort me. What we're, he, what we're seeing here is a relationship. This is a relationship of Jesus, our shepherd, and us as his sheep, where he's, he's coming through the right way. He's leading us. He's not forcing us. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, Look at what it says at the end of verse 4. For they know his voice. Do you, can you sit here today? Can you truly sit here today and say you know the voice of God? Can you honestly sit here? If God was standing right in front of you, would God say that, that my daughter right there, she hears my voice? Would God say that about you? So if Jesus says that we hear his voice, that means that there must be something that will prevent us from hearing his voice. This is Jesus with the false teachers. And he brings them out and he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet, verse 5, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but they will flee from him. Remember, the context is false teachers, 7, 8, 9, 10. The context is false teachers. Not once have we talked about the devil. Not once. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from them. That means there's voices that you're hearing in this season of your life that you're supposed to turn away from that voice. But you don't even know that it's not the voice of God. You don't even know because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You, Jesus knows your name, but you don't know his voice. We're talking about a relationship with a shepherd that he wants to be with you. Jesus wants to lead you to where you're always safe, to where you're always blessed, to where you're always growing, to where you're always protected. This is what we're seeing right here. This is what we're seeing right here. They know his voice. This is why your online pastor that's from a mega church, it's impossible for him to be your pastor because that pastor doesn't know your name. That pastor cannot lead you. That pastor doesn't know your struggles. That pastor doesn't know your children. You understand that God designed designed his voice to be magnified through leadership in churches. So you need to understand that the voice of God, which is the voice of Jesus, should be the same voice as who you call your pastor. Now, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Here it is. Osiris, I forgot to send you um, this image, but I need you to put it up. Lord, we thank you for being perfect, Lord. We're never perfect, but you are. We're never perfect, but you are, Lord. And that's why we serve you, Jesus, because you're perfect. As soon as you have it, Osiris, please put it up on the screen. All right? So now, we see they will by no means follow a stranger, but he will flee from them, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Verse 6, Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. 
over and over in 8, 9, and 10, they kept 7, 8, 9, and 10, they kept saying they didn't understand, Sister Leslie. Jesus is saying, I'm trying to tell you something and they don't understand. That means that there is an opportunity for you not to understand what you're hearing. Don't assume that you know the voice of God. This is what this passage looks like. That's Jesus at the door. That's why the Bible says that the, the, the shepherd, he goes through the door, right? He's the, that's why they, the Bible says that Jesus is the door, that nobody gets to the father through him. The hireling, the, the, the false teacher, the robber goes over because he doesn't have a relationship, okay? He doesn't have a relationship with the sheep. This is what happens when we do things out of order. This is Jesus. He sits and he waits and with a hedge of protection over your life. You got to understand that the G, when in, in the Bible, Jesus used illustrative terms because that's how they understood. It's like when you tell somebody from Lawrence and they're like, you know, where are you from? Oh, I'm from, I don't know, North Lawrence, well, Jackson Street, by the Green Bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why Jesus uses these types of illustrations. Now, verse 7, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. When Jesus says, I am, Brother Maurice, open up the service with this. God is the great I am. Yahweh Elohim is the great I am. So when Jesus says, I am, it's a way of Jesus saying that he's God. So when you're walking in the street, come on, come on, we should clap for that. So when you're walking in the street and you run into Je the Jehovah's Witnesses that have taken over the city of Lawrence and they tell you that Jesus is not God, you have to understand this is why the book of John is unique. It's the only book that has the seven I am's. It's called the seven I am's where Jesus says, I am. And in, in these biblical times, when you say I am, it was considered that you are identifying with God. And you can still see that in today. When you say, I am stupid, then that you shall be. I am fat. I am ugly. I am dumb. I am depressed. I am confused. I am anxious. You become a partner with whatever you say you are. That's how powerful it is. Let me prove it to you. Jesus says right here in verse 7, most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. But in other parts of the book of John, he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, I am. That's what he is. That's what he is. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. That's why Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the true vine. All of the, the seven I am's are in the book of John. Now, verse 8. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 8, all who have ever come before me are thieves and robbers. Now we see thieves and robbers again. But the sheep did not hear them. Jesus says it again. Remember, when the Bible repeats something twice, that's what the theme is about. It's like our lives. When God tells you something twice, that's what he wants you to do. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, anyone... Anyone, there's false doctrines of Calvinism that say, the Jehovah's Witness say that only 144,000 people are going to be saved. So Jesus Christ died on the cross for only 144,000. That ain't even a party. You understand? 144,000, but the Bible says, if anyone enters by me, that's an open invitation to every tongue, every tribe, and every nation right there. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go. You got to put that Bible verse back up. And he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. When Jesus is your shepherd, you're able to go in and out and nothing is going to happen to you. You're able to move through life and weapons will be formed against you, but they will not prosper. That's what it says. I am the door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's the thief. The thief in this 
passage is the false teachers. The false teachers that you're listening to, they are going to kill, destroy, and ruin your life. That's what that verse is talking about. Because if the devil can change that Bible verse to make it seem like the devil, then the person that you're following that's giving you the false teaching, you don't even know that he's dangerous. It matters. It matters who you're listening to. It matters. It matters who you're listening to. It matters. I say it all the time, and I'm going to say it all the time. I've been saved for nine years. For seven years of my life, for seven years, Sister Arlen, I was confused. I was preaching the word of God in error. I didn't even know the word of God. I thought I knew the word of God because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is destruction. And the Holy Spirit is using my voice for this congregation and for the online family that we're growing to tell you to watch out for the people that you're listening to. Watch out for the people that you're listening to. My job in this church, as the pastor of this church, is to make sure that you're always listening to that pastor. Jesus is your pastor. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the door. Whoever says anything opposite from Jesus, run. Run. This is a warning. I'm telling you right now, there is a move of the Holy Spirit that is going to come on the earth. God is going to start holding teachers accountable because we're leading the sheep astray. We're leading the sheep astray. People don't even know what... Life is anymore. It's a big religious system. I spoke to somebody on Friday morning, and this sister said, when I go to other churches, I'm really confused. And she said, when I go to your church, I understand and I'm able to grow. And I said, it's not the, the, the character of the person, because it happens to the apostles. The character of the person, is, is, is the Lord uses it for his glory. But it's not me that she's listening to. It's the Holy Spirit is in her, which is what I told her, is telling her, this is the way. Walk in it. Jesus does not, he's not, he's not, we just went through four chapters. He's not battling the devil. He's battling the false teachers. The false teachers, they're going to lead you astray, especially in this church. Here's the second warning. There's wolves that are coming, spiritual wolves. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. Spiritual wolves that are coming to this church to confuse you from the voice of the shepherd. You have to understand the word of God. We went to Bread and Roses on Saturday. And I went, and it was a supernatural occurrence. I went because God has instructed me to start to disciple my 15-year-old son. To start growing him now. I've been talking to him, telling him that the baby phase that he went through is done. And now I'm speaking to him like a man and I'm teaching him the word of God. I don't go serve at Bread and Roses because that's for other people in the church. I serve the church in other ways. As we're going down, I'm talking to him about the power of serving. I'm telling him, son, when you serve God, when you serve God's people, when you serve in the community, supernatural things happen. This is me on my way down to tell him we go to Bread and Roses. We go to Bread and Roses. We're working there. And all of a sudden, there's a young man. He took a liking to me, to Brother Fantuzzi and Brother Elias. We're upstairs in Bread and Roses. And all of a sudden, he just starts talking. And he's like, I have church today. I said, oh, you going to church today? He said, yes, yeah, the Sabbath. You got to honor the Sabbath. But immediately, my, my, my ears heightened. Because most churches are not living the commandments of God. So I wasn't like, yeah, yeah, the the Sabbath. What I said was, I said, I believe this man is in error in my spirit. He starts talking. He says, no. And I said, is it a seven-day Adventist church? He's like, I don't even know. He's like, I just go because my parents go. I said, but what do they believe? Why do they go to church on a Saturday? Me trying to assess what, what he's saying, right? Like a nurse. You got a headache? Okay. What do you eat? How much water do you drink? What do you what do? You do? The Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I put my hand on his elbow, and I say to him, you're living in a church that has a false doctrine, and you need to run. Out of nowhere, right? The Bible says that you need two to three witnesses for a thing to be established. So Brother Fantuzzi's there, and he's watching this whole thing take place. 
Five minutes later, he tells me, you know, there's something that I'm seeing in the church that I don't think is right. And as soon as he told me that, I had told him right before, I said, once you see something false, you're going to see a lot. Once there's, my God, once there is a biblical error, the gates of hell open up on that church. You got no protection from the shepherd if you're going to do your own thing. The thief and the robber, they go over the, the, the hedge, the ledge. He tells me, I feel like God is speaking to me. I said, what is God saying? He's like, well, it's a female pastor. And I went, oh. He's like, but I, I think there's something wrong. And I said, why? And he's like, because they're always getting drunk. Listen to me. Open your eyes. Open your ears. Open your eyes. There's people that know that something is wrong in the churches. But anybody that opens their mouth for anything that is against mainstream Christianity, you're going to get killed spiritually and physically. The religious folk that came for Jesus, the religious folk studied the law, studied the prophets, and Jesus is standing in front of them, the embodiment of the Torah, and they're saying, that ain't it. People have, there's something in the spirit that's happening. There's something in the spirit that's coming. There's a cleaning of the churches. There's a cleaning of the altar. There's a cleaning of the pulpit coming. I'm telling you. That's why God has called this church. I want to raise the bar. I want to raise the bar of teaching in the, in the church. There's people that have said to me, you don't need to do Bible studies in the church. Just do the home groups. That's the issue. Is that we forgot that this is the central of everything that happens in the kingdom. The Bible study in this church is the strongest ministry from Tuesday, Wednesday, 5 a.m. to Wednesday night. Because if you can grow in the voice of God through the word of God, you can do greater things. You can, not, you can make sure that you don't get led astray. He says that, the young man says, I told them that some of them are his family members. He says, I told them that they're not supposed to get drunk. And they told me, no, that's okay because Jesus turned water into wine. When you speak up about this stuff, I'm getting killed. I'm getting killed. And you know what's so funny? Is the more that I get attacked for speaking the things that Jesus speaks about, the devil loses with me because I go more in that direction. Because I wasn't, I wasn't getting attacked when I was sitting in the church on the bench. It wasn't until I started telling people, yo, we're reading the Bible wrong and we need to get back to sound doctrine. This man is sitting there and he's 18 years old. Me, Brother Fantuzzi, and Brother Elias, we start praying over him because he has the gift of discernment. If he can see that at 18. There's people in churches that have been in churches for 20 years that they don't even know that they're in error. There's people that have come here to this church. And have said to me, Pastor, this is what they're teaching in my church. What do I do? I don't, I don't, you got to take that to God. This has been happening since the biblical times. People are in error. It's not the devil. It's the false teachers that come to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they ha may have it more abundantly. Because he's the good shepherd. So Jesus isn't going to tell the Baptists one thing and the Pentecostals another thing and the seven-day Adventists another thing and the Jehovah's Witness another thing because God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Amen. So you have to understand and protect your ears. Listen to the voice of God through the word of God. The non-confusing voice of God. Listen, an abundant life is not an incredibly long life. You're not supposed to live a long life. The Bible says that if you live over 70 years, that you're living off of the strength of the Lord. And we live life like if we're going to live this thing until we're 100. And that's not the way that this goes. This is why we fall into the deception because we're trying to preserve a life 
that was never meant to be lived long. An abundant life is not an easy life. An abundant life is not a comfortable life. There's something about being in the presence of God that everything is going to hell, and you're like, I, I, I think I got this. I think I, I, th- I see God in this. And they're like, bro, but your life is imploding. Yeah, but that's what I see. That's not what he said. Because Jesus said, I have life, but I came to live life to give you life more abundant. Okay? So now we move on and we say that life is a matter of degrees. Some people have life in the biblical times. There were certain candles that they would make that were made of clay, and they would put olive oil in the clay. But the wick, it wasn't strong enough to be lit. It's like that candle that you have to keep lighting. Okay? We're not supposed to live like that in the kingdom. That's not an abundant life, that one day you're hot, one day you're cold, one day you're hot, one day you're cold, one day you're bound, one day you're free. That's not what it is. That's not what life in the kingdom is. When Jesus says he's going to give you life more abundant, it is a life, someone that has an abundant life has a life of stamina, has a life of increased energy, has a life of influence, has the ability to do things has an overflow of enjoyment. Somebody with an abundant life knows what it takes to win. Somebody with an abundant life gives honor to the shepherd for that life. And Jesus is still giving that life. Verse 11, Jesus says it again. I am the good shepherd. And he repeats it in the next sentence. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus gave his life so that he could lead you to where you need to be. And that's, those are the type of leaders that you need to look for in your life. Is, are, are the leaders in your life concerned about what you're concerned about? Are the leaders in your life l- trying to lead you into the presence of God? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Verse 12. But. Somebody say but. But. But, in, but is an adversative conjunction. That's what it's called. What the word but does, especially in scripture, is it takes two thoughts and it makes them opposed to one another. Right? Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. But a hireling. So now we see a thief. Now we see a robber. Now we see a hireling. A hireling is somebody that works for money. Okay? A hireling is he who is not the shepherd. One who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catch, catches the sheep and scatters them. Praise God. Guys, the hireling flees because he is a, if he's on his phone, get him off the phone. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. The hireling is not the person that is guiding you into the presence of God. The hireling is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and he leaves and he flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Verse 13, the hireling flees because he's a hireling and he does not care about the sheep. There's certain people in your life that don't care about your spiritual upbringing. There's some people, I mean, it's in scripture. It's in scripture. Everything in this church, I always tell you, assess me. Watch me, watch me and watch my wife and watch me and my wife. Watch me, watch my wife, watch my life, watch my home. Watch me, watch my wife, watch my marriage, watch my home, watch my kids. You're supposed to watch me and assess and say, do I see Jesus in this man? And you're supposed to do it to everybody that you listen to. Everybody that's feeding you the word of God. You're supposed to do the same thing. Because if Jesus is telling us that there's wolves that will lead you astray, then that means that people are still leading people astray. Be careful who you listen to. The Bible says faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Did you know? 
that the first sense, the first, the, out of the five senses, the first one that you get is your hearing. When you're in the womb, hearing is the first thing that you get. And it's the last thing to go. That's why in an ICU, they taught us in nursing school, never talk recklessly around a patient just because they're intubated, because they listen. That's why when you go into an ICU, you see us nurses speaking to a patient like having full-blown conversations. Because even though they're sedated, they're, they're still listening. That's the power of, of your ears. That's the power of who you listen to. That even when your body is locked and you can't even move, you can still hear. There's patients that have been molested, that have been raped, that when they come out of the coma, they said, the guy, it's usually a guy, the guy that was working the, the second shift, they'll bring the, the nurse in and they'll make the guy talk and they'll say it was him. That's the power of ears. The sheep, it turns the ear. The sheep turn the ears to hear the voice of the shepherd. So when you, you are in a church, listen, even the things that we teach in this church, the things that we teach in this church, we're reading entire chapters. I can't confuse you if I read the entire chapter. I put my notes on social media for the whole world to see and assess what it is that I'm feeding the sheep. I don't know any other pastor that does that. I don't know any pastor. I want to raise the bar. I don't care that nobody else is doing it. I want to do it because I want to show you the way to find God. I want to help you hear the voice of God so you can do great things for God. If, listen, the twisting of scripture is from the garden. The twisting of scripture is from the garden of Eden. God said, don't eat from the, knowledge, the, tree, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The devil said, did he really say that? Boom. That's it. Once you're confused, you'll get used. Once the devil can confuse you, he'll use you. That's why learning the commandments, learning the Torah has taken my brain. I tell Eunice all the time, sometimes I cry out of joy because I never, my brain is it's exploding with just knowledge. Now God can build on it and I want that. Jesus wants that for you and I want that for you. Jesus wants you to grow in knowledge in the simplicity. Now the issue is, is when you get down to the truth and then you don't want to accept the truth. The issue is, is when the truth clashes with what you were taught. The issue is when you grew up Pentecostal and all of a sudden you find out that there's some things that are not very Pentecostal-ish. What are you going to do about that? That's the issue. But Jesus came to give us life more abundantly. The hireling flees. Verse 14, he says it again. I am the good shepherd and I, and I know my sheep. And am known by my sheep. What we're seeing here is a relationship that the false teachers don't have with the sheep. That the religious folk don't have with the sheep. Verse 15. As the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them I also must bring. To the Bible study class, there's the new covenant. There's the Jew and the Gentile. There's the one body. Jesus is not coming back for the Dominicans. He's not coming back for the Puerto Ricans. He's not coming back for the Greek, for the Italians, for the Catholics, for the Protestants. Jesus is coming back for one people. He's coming back for one people. Look at what, look at what the Bible says. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I also must bring. That's what we learned in Ephesians, that Jesus is the, what is the unifier to the seed of promise. And they will hear my voice. They will hear my voice. And there will be one flock. There will be how many? So when, so when they come up, so when they tell you that the church gets raptured, but the Jews stay and face the wrath of God, where is that in Scripture? Come on, come on, Pastor. We just say stuff in the Bible. We just say whatever. And we say that that's what it is. The Apostle Paul said, are we all teachers? Are we all teachers? Somos todo maestro entonces. Everybody's a teacher of the word. And God says, that's not true. Anybody with the social media platform is a teacher now. Right, right. 
And other sheep I have which are, not in, which are not in this fold, them I also must bring and they will hear my voice and that we will be one flock. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay my life down for the sheep. And t- excuse me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. That is the Trinity. When people say, oh, well, the Bible doesn't say the Trinity. Oh, this, this, this. Listen, listen to this. My father loves me and I lay down my life that I may take it again. That's the deity of Jesus Christ. So then the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 11, that the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. So what is it? Did the Holy Spirit raise Christ from the dead or did Jesus raise himself from the dead? Or, or is the Holy Spirit God and he's triune? Because what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that verse? Therefore, my father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it again. He laid down his life. That's why people think that Christians are weak because Jesus left. It's a prophecy was fulfilled that it says that he wasn't going to make a sound. He didn't make a noise. So they think that you're weak because whatever your leader does, that's who they think you are. If your leader is weak, you're weak. If your leader is is confused, you're confused. That's why the Bible says when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a fire in his eyes and he's going to open up the heavens and he's going to come back. He left like a lamb, but he comes back like a lion and he comes back for the one flock. Look at verse 18. No one takes it from me. No one takes it from me. The way that that Christianity paints the picture of Jesus, it's like there was this helpless thing. He was on an assignment. Jesus was on an assignment. Jesus said, yo, I came for this. I came to die for my people. I came. The hireling didn't die. The false teacher didn't die. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down myself. Oh, what's next, Jesus? No, no, no. What's next? He said, I have the power to lay it down. Come on. And I have the power to take it up again. Come on. Come on, man. Come on. That's the God that we serve. That's why we listen to Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that does this. I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my father, verse 19. Therefore, there was a division among the Jews. You see? There's always a division. There's always people that hear that don't hear. There's always people that they say that they're hearing from God, but they're not hearing from God. Here's why. The natural analytical person cannot and will not understand spiritual things. This is spiritual. You cannot read the word of God or study the word of God through the flesh, through your rationality. It's only by the spirit. No matter how much you try to explain it to them in a spiritual sense, they won't get it. Why? Because their mind is not open to the things of the supernatural. Their heart is hardened. There's people that have been in in church 20, 30, 40 years. Those are the hardest people to teach. Because that's not what I was taught. The people that I found that are easier to teach are the new believers in Christ. A new believer, you tell them, look, here, the Bible doesn't contradict itself, and this is what you have to do. Uh, Coffee's in the kitchen. Be at church by 1030. No problem. You tell somebody that's 20 years in ministry, 30 years in ministry, they're like, that's not what it says. Because there's so much confusion. So when someone who's analytical, their mind is already made up. When you go into Scripture, you have to go listening to the mind of Jesus, not going to tell Jesus what you want to hear. So you start wasting your time and your breath by attempting these types of things. You can see nature everywhere. You can see this everywhere. There's things that I see in nature. That's why I love nature. I love looking out the window in my house everywhere I go. I love looking at nature to help me see God. So I'm not, it's not a blind faith. But that's why the Apostle Paul says, Osiris, I sent the image. That's why the Apostle Paul says, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolish to him, nor can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Let me show you something. Put the image up of the ducks. I don't know what it is about 
the animal kingdom. But I see scripture in the animal kingdom. Nobody taught those little ducklings to follow the mom. It's a design. You understand? If, if, if I took one of those ducks and, and, and held it back and the mom took off, the duck would still know how to find the mom. When Jesus says that we're supposed to know his voice, this is what that's supposed to look like. It's not one duck walking one way, one duck walking one way, one duck, duck walking another way because then you'll lead, it'll lead to death. It's, that is such a simple explanation to what John 10 is about. You see, that mother, if you tried to grab one of those ducklings, that mother would attack you. I think every, everybody's tried that. I've tried that. Everybody's tried that. You know, you always do the just to see if they're going to come and then you're like, okay, 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 I get it. Why? Because there's protection from the leader. Jesus is like that. If a duck can scare you away from the ducklings, imagine when somebody gets close to a sheep of Jesus. That's the awareness of today. The awareness of today is to help you hear the voice of God. Now, as we close, the faithful pastor will, as an under-shepherd... We're called pastors, but we're really a sheepdog. You know the sheepdog, they just run and gather the sheep? Jesus is the pastor. We must display the same characteristics as the good shepherd. He sacrifices himself for the sheep, and he knows the sheep. So we're supposed to do the same thing. You see people all the time on social media, a, a mega pastor. They're like, that's my pastor. Like, how? Because you like this post? Because you shared it? That's not the way this was designed. The Bible calls Jesus the good shepherd, and we go to 1 Peter chapter 5. The elders who are among you, I exhort. I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Verse 2, shepherd the flock. This is Peter speaking to pastors. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. Look at the Bible calls Jesus the good shepherd, and the Bible calls Jesus the chief shepherd. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade. In Hebrews 13, verse 20, the Bible calls Jesus the good shepherd. The Bible calls Jesus the chief shepherd. The Bible calls Jesus the great shepherd. Now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus. Jesus goes on to say in the book of John. In verse 27. Verse 26. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice. Verse 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch, oh check this out, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Look at this, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So now we're in Jesus' hand, and now we're in the Father's hand. So does that mean that, we're, that there's two gods, or is the same hand that we're on is one eternal God being who died for you? Now's your chance to respond. Verse 30. To bring it all together. Let's read this together. Verse 30. One, two, three. I and my father are one. 
The Bible is so simple. The voice of God is so simple. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never asked the great shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd to come into your life, if you've never repented for your sins, if you've never, if you're just here and it's your first time here and you've never heard anything about the Lord and you understand that you do not have Jesus Christ as your God, as your Savior and your Master, come to the front. 